Rambam Mishnah Torah, one chapter a day, Nezirut, chapter nine. Halacha one. The following rules apply when a person sets aside money for the sacrifices of ne of Nazarites. Those sacrifices were offered, and there is no money left over. He should bring sacrifices of other Nazarites with whose funds with those funds, for the remainder of money set aside for Nazarite offerings should be used for Nazarite offerings. If one set aside money for his own Nazarite offering, without specifying for which sacrifice it should be used, and money was left over, the remaining funds should be used for free will offerings. Halakha 2. When a person set, uh, set aside money that was designated for specific purposes for his Nazarite offering and money was left over, the remainder of the funds set aside for the, burn, for the burnt offering should be used for a burnt offering. The remainder of the funds set aside for the sinner offering should be brought to the Dead Sea. The remainder of the funds set aside for the peace offering should be used for a peace offering. There is no need that the offering be accompanied by bread. It is eaten for one day. Halacha 3. The following rules apply when a person set aside money for sacrifices uh, set aside money for sacrifices for his Nazarite vow and died. If the money was not designated for specific sacrifices, it should be used for free will offerings. If the money had been designated for specific sacrifices, the funds set aside for the burnt offering should be used for a burnt offering. The funds set aside for the sin offering should be brought to the Dead Sea. The funds set aside for the peace offering should be used for a peace offering. It is eaten for one day. There is no need that the offering be accompanied by bread. Halakha 4. What is meant by money not designated for specific sacrifices? For example, a Nazarite set aside money to use to bring his sacrifices and did not say anything. If, however, he said, this is for my obligation, it's as if they have been designated for a specific purpose. Needless to say that if he says, this money is for my burnt offering, sin offering, and peace offering, the money is considered as set aside for a specific purpose. Halakha 5. When a person set aside an animal with a blemish, for his sacrifice, it is as if he set aside money without without designating it for a specific purpose. Similarly, if he set aside a slab of silver or of gold or a utensil, it is as if he set aside money without, without designating it for a specific purpose. This applies even if he said, this is for my burnt offering, sin offering, and peace offering. When a person... Oops, sorry... Halacha 6. When a person says, these funds are for my sin offering, and the remainder is for my Nazarite offering, and dies, and dies, or a woman made such statements, and then her husband nullified her Nazarite vow, the money for the sin offering should be brought to the Dead Sea. Half of the remainder of the money should be used for a burnt offering, and half for a sin offering. Halacha 7. If he says, these funds are for my burnt offering, the remainder is for my Nazarite offering, and then he dies. The money the money for the burnt offering should be used for a burnt offering, and the remainder should be used for free will offerings. Halacha 8. When a person thought that he was obligated in a Nazarite vow, and set aside his sacrifices, and then inquired of a sage, who told him that his statements do not constitute a vow, and he is not obligated to be a Nazarite, what should he do with the sacrifices that he set aside? They should go and pasture with the rest of the herd. For if for they were consecrated in error, and that consecration is not binding, as will be explained in the appropriate place. Halacha 9. The following rules apply when a woman takes a Nazarite vow and set, her, and set aside her sacrifices, and afterwards her husband nullified her vow. If the animal belonged to him, it should go out and pasture in the herd. For a person cannot consecrate an article that does not belong to him. If the animal set aside for sacrifices were hers, and her husband did not own any part of them, e.g. they were given to her as a present on the condition that her husband have no authority over them, but instead she could do whatever she wants with them, the sin offering should be left to die. 
the burnt offering should be sacrificed as a burnt offering, and the peace offering should be sacrificed as a peace offering. It is eaten for one day. There is no need that the offering be accompanied by bread. Halakha 10. If a woman set aside money that was not designated for, spe for specific sacrifices, it should be used to purchase free will offerings. If it was designated for specific purposes, the funds set aside for the burnt offering should be used for the burnt offering. The funds set aside for the sin offering should be brought to the Dead Sea. The funds set aside for the peace offering should be used for a peace offering. It is eaten for one day. There is no need that the offering be accompanied by bread. Halakha 11. When a woman took a Nazarite vow, and became ritually impure due to contact with the corpse in the midst of the days of her Nazarite vow, and afterwards her husband heard of her vow and nullified it, she must still bring the sacrifices required when a Nazarite becomes ritually impure. Halakha 12. When a father binds his son to a Nazarite vow and set aside sacrifices, but the son did not desire this Nazarite vow, and he or his relatives objected, or he shaved himself, or his relatives shaved him. The sin offering should be left to die. The burnt offering should be sacrificed as a burnt offering, and the peace offering should be sacrificed as a peace offering. It is eaten for one day. There is no need that the offering be accompanied by bread. If he set aside money that was not designated for specific sacrifices, it should be used to purchase free will offerings. If it was designated for specific purposes, the funds set aside for the burnt offering should be used for a burnt offering. The funds set aside for the sin offering should be brought to the Dead Sea. The funds set aside for the peace offering should be used for a peace offering. It is eaten for one day. There is no need that the offering be accompanied by bread. Halakha 13. When a person says, I'll be a Nazarite when a son is born to me and sets aside a sacrifice, his wife miscarries and then she gives birth, the status of the sacrifices is questionable. It is forbidden to shear them or perform labor with them. Halakha 14. A question arises when there are two Nazarites. One becomes ritually impure due to contact with a corpse and it is not known which of them and it is not known which of them became ritually impure. How should they bring their sacrifices? They should bring their sacrifices required uh, when emerging from impurity and the sacrifices that mark the completion of a Nazarite vow in purity at the conclusion of the span of their Nazarite vow. One of them then says, if I was the one who became impure, the sacrifices to emerge from impurity are mine and the sacrifices that mark the completion of a Nazarite vow in purity are yours. If I'm the one who is ritually pure, the sacrifices that mark the completion of a Nazarite vow in purity are mine, and the sacrifices to emerge from impurity are yours. After bringing these sacrifices, they both then count the full span of another Nazarite vow and bring another set of sacrifices that mark the completion of a Nazarite vow in purity. They then bring the sacrifices that mark the completion of a Nazarite vow in purity, and one says, if I was the one who was ritually impure, the sacrifices brought previously to mark the emergence from impurity were mine, and the sacrifices brought to mark the completion of a Nazarite vow in purity were yours, and these are the sacrifices that mark my completion of a, of a Nazarite vow impurity. If I was the one who was ritually pure, the sacrifices were brought previously to mark the completion of a Nazarite vow in purity were mine, and those brought to mark the emergence from impurity were yours. And these are the sacrifices that mark your completion of a Nazarite vow in purity. Thus, neither one lost anything in bringing these sacrifices. Halakha 15. If one of them dies, the other one must bring a fowl as a sin offering and an animal as a burnt offering and say, if I became impure, the sin offering fulfills my obligation. The burnt offering is a free will offering. If I was pure, the burnt offering is my obligation and the fowl brought as a sin offering is because of the doubt. 
He then counts the full span of another Nazarite vow and brings the sacrifices required when completing a Nazarite vow and purity. He should say, if I was impure, the first burnt offering I brought is a free will offering, and this is the sacrifice that I am obligated to bring. If I was pure, then the first burnt offering was obligatory. This is a free will offering, and these are the remainder of my sacrifices. In these instances, neither of them perform the shaving to emerge from ritual impurity unless they are minors or women. The rationale is that these individuals should not shave their heads because of a doubt. Halakha 16. How could a doubt arise for, for them with regard to whether they contracted ritual impurity? For example, two Nazarites were standing in a private domain where the ruling is that if a doubt concerning ritual impurity arises in a private domain, the person is considered impure. A person who was standing outside saw them and said, I saw that one of you became impure, but I do not know which one it is. If, however, this witness is together with him in the courtyard, they are both ritually pure. The rationale is that since there are three of them, they are considered as many people. And when there are many people in a private domain, when a doubt arises concerning them, they are ritually pure like a doubt concerning like a doubt concerning ritual impurity in the public domain, as will be explained in its place. Halakha 17. When does the above apply? When both Nazarites remain silent, or the matter is doubtful for them, if, however, one of them says, I did not become ritually impure, even if two witnesses testify that he became impure, he does not bring a sacrifice because of their statements. His statement, I did not become ritually impure, can be understood to mean, I will not bring a sacrifice because of impurity, because I have already asked a sage to absolve my vow. Thus he is not contradicting the witnesses, and a person's word is accepted with regard to his own person. If, however, he remains silent, or was in doubt concerning the matter, he should bring a sacrifice, even when the cause is the testimony of one witness, as we explained above. Similarly, if a witness tells a person, you took a Nazarite vow in my presence, and that person disputes the matter, he is not liable for anything. If he does not dispute the matter, he must observe the restrictions of a Nazarite vow because of his statements. Even if a person told two others, I saw one of you taking a Nazarite vow, but I do, know, do not know which one of you it was, since neither of them dispute his statements, they, must, they both must observe a Nazarite vow because of his statements. If a person observed a Nazarite vow because of the statements of one witness and drank wine or became impure due to contact with a corpse and two witnesses, two witnesses administered a warning, he is given lashes even though the fundamental dimension of the testimony is dependent on one witness. Halakha 18. When a corpse was lying across the breadth of a path and a Nazarite walked by there, he is pure. This applies even if the only way to pass was to step over the corpse or to touch it, and even if it was a source of impurity that was known. The rationale is that when there is an unresolved doubt concerning ritual impurity in the public domain, we consider the person pure. When does the Halakha 19, when does the above apply? When he was walking. If, however, he was riding or carrying a burden, he is impure. The rationale is that it is possible for a person who is walking on his feet not to touch a corpse, have his body pass over it, nor move it. When, by contrast, a person is carrying a burden or riding, it is impossible for him not to touch the corpse, have his body pass over it, nor move it, for the corpse is lying across the path.